Amen. Thank you. Go ahead and be seated. Man, God's amazing, huh? And he hasn't failed us, and he never will fail us, and I praise him for that, and, and I hope that you've experienced that. Man, thank you for that wonderful time of praise and worship. And man, isn't it good to see the choir full? And I, we're hoping to get it, yeah, we're hoping to get it even fuller when we can... But we can start packing them in a little tighter. We want to continue. So, folks, we, we want you to be a part of, of our choir. And uh, they'll be having practice a little bit later on this afternoon again. Today, I want to continue on making church the place to be. And as we look at this, we know then that the church will be the place to be. Again, as I shared with you last week, when we do what is required of us as believers. Oh, yeah, children's church. Yes, it is time... For children's church. So with kindergarten, first and second graders, if you want to, you can go ahead and be dismissed and head back there. Miss Carrie and them are there waiting on you. So go ahead and go if you guys want to make it, okay? But today I want to continue on the second part of my message as I shared with you last week. It was a two-part message as what was required of us and it was to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is our reasonable act of service. And then it goes on to say, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Today I want to look at the second part of that, and it's found uh, entitled, Our Behavior. What, what does it happen? What happens when we do present our bodies a living sacrifice? What does it, how does it affect us and how we behave? A few weeks ago, I also ended a sermon by stating the fact that we are children of King, so let's begin to act like it. Amen? Let's begin to act like who we are and whose we are. And not just with the confidence that we have as children of the King, but also with the humility and with the love that we're supposed to be having. So today, our behavior. I want to look at basically the idea of the component that, that is sometimes missing and it's found in Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Now, the rest of chapter uh, 12 and all of chapter 13 basically hinge on the fact of Romans 12, 9. How we do this and how we allow this to happen in our lives. Let's go ahead and if you would stand in honor of reading God's word. You at home follow along with us. Romans chapter 12, verse 9 very simply says... Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for the blessings you've given us, for the opportunity to gather here this morning. Thank you for those, again, that are watching us through the live stream. And Father, I pray that you would speak to us this morning. That, God, you would empower us to let us see, Lord, how we are to be conducting ourselves to the world and to each other. And Father, I pray that as I go through this message that the words I'm about to say, these will not be my words, but Father, they'll be your words. I pray that this is not a message that I've come up with, but Lord, that you have done for me. And this is your message. And Father, I pray that, that God, it would be received and responded to as you desire for it to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Go ahead and be seated. Today I want to look at our behavior as Christians, that we are children of the King, and so we ought to act like it. It ought to affect our behavior and how we do things in our own lives. Now, if we were to continue reading through the rest of, uh, of chapter 12, we would see that there's indicators of, of our behavior. We look then at uh, chapter 13, which is called the love chapter, and then we see there that, that how we are to love. But all of that is hinging upon verse 9, where it basically says there, let love be without hypocrisy. So what is this idea of let love be without hypocrisy? It's, it's pure love. It's the idea of love that we, listen, it's an idea of love that you and I on our own are not capable of. Because our love is coming from an impure heart, which is a selfish heart, which desires things for ourselves, And so under our own abilities, everything that we do, we love those who basically are able to do stuff toward us. That's how we love. But what we need to understand is what the Bible wants us to do is have this pure love. And it's, it's something that we, that we choose to do. We choose to do this. 
Do I have pure love or do I have my selfish love? It's a choice that we make on a regular basis that again comes apart by the idea of the rest of first part of chapter 12, making ourselves a living sacrifice. So this pure love is basically a love without hypocrisy. It's pureness. It's God working through us. And in other words, it's a grace love. And this is why I'm saying that on our own, you and I are not capable of this because we are not capable of God's love. We're not capable of that grace love. And so what is grace love? Well, we look at a couple things about grace love and we see that it's what is needed rather than what is deserved. This is a type of love because as I said earlier, that we have a love in ourselves and we throw away, throw around this word love all the time. I mean, we throw it out there like it's candy. But what we need to understand is this idea of grace love is, is a love that is that we do what is needed rather than what is deserved. And so what we do is we love those who deserve our love and we hold back our love from those who don't deserve it. But this grace love is the idea of God loving us when we didn't deserve it. My friends, can I share here with you today and all you at home, can I share this with you that we are not deserving of God's love? We are not deserving of God's grace. We are not deserving of God's pure love given to us. So I praise God that I'm getting what he feels I need rather than what I deserve. Amen. I need Jesus in my life. I don't deserve Jesus, but I, I need him. The world needs Jesus. They don't deserve Jesus, but they need him. Everything that goes on in all of our society, everything that's going on in our nation today can all be taken care of with the idea and the love of Jesus. My friend, the world needs him, but we don't deserve him. So we go the same way. That's why Jesus said, I want you to love your enemy. Love your enemy. Because this is the idea that we don't think our enemy deserves to love us because they've hurt us. They've attacked us. They don't want good for us, so they don't deserve our love. Jesus said, man, this is the idea of grace love. This is love without hypocrisy. It's love what is needed rather than what is deserved. But it's also a love of value. How precious was the blood of Jesus? We sing about, oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. It's a precious love. Man, it's a love that, that is, is, has great value. Jesus said, that, the Bible says that we were purchased, but we were purchased with a great price. It costs a lot to purchase us, amen? Jesus had to die on the cross for us. So his love is a valuable love, man, it's, it's a precious love. But not only a love of value, but it's a love of esteem. This idea of lifting up, being encouragement, helping people. Don't do it just because you, you want something from it. My friends, listen to me. We ought to be loving each other. And the love that we're talking about here starts in the church, starts toward our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. That we are to be lifting each other up, not tearing each other down. And as a matter of fact, the Bible says when it begins here, that's how the world is going to know that we're his disciples, that they see us loving each other. And our love is an, is an esteeming love, lifting each other up. Man, again, we, we, we only have to look through social media and we find out how much lifting up is going on in social media. Amen? But that's not a pure love. A pure love is an esteeming love. To esteem others more than yourself. To lift them up. To hope better for them more than you hope for yourself. Not receiving anything from it at all. But it's an esteeming love. But it's also a love that treasures. A love that holds a special place toward an object that one that you want to take good care of can i tell you here today my friends god treasures us amen god treasures me he treasures you he treasures you at home it means that you're very special you are the crowning point of his uh, of, of, of all creation that's us we are precious i shared in the first service the idea, this is played out in my office, the idea of, 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 of something that is, is something that you hold great value in. In my office, there, if you've ever gone in there, I have uh, several items that have been given to me. I've had several items that I've purchased, uh, other things that, that uh, people have given me, and, and, and I put them up and I display them. Well, if you walk into my office and on my cabinet, 
you see that I have a lot of OU stuff and Boomer, yeah, even after yesterday, I still have it on. <sighs> but I still have it on there. And I have my, some of my Dallas Cowboys stuff and I have some Elvis stuff. So it's all there on display for everyone to see on the wall. Got some very valuable stuff that I like. But in my office, I know that there's going to be times that kids will come into my office with their parents, and I love having kids come into my office. I do. I know every kid's, oh, no, don't go into pastor's office. I love kids coming in there. And so what I've done is on my shelf, down at the bottom level where those kids can get to them, there are some things in there that I don't mind them grabbing. There's some old basketballs in there. There's other little things that they can play with, and I don't really care. They can come in and pick them up. It's okay with me. But then you go up a little higher and there's some things a little higher that I don't want the kids to be able to walk in and just grab a hold of because they, they mean a little bit more to me, a little bit more valuable to me. So they're up a little higher. But yet still people can walk in and they can pick them up and look at them. I don't, I don't care. But then when you go to the top, top of my cabinet, above all everything else, there's three objects up there. And there are two footballs and a basketball. And two, one of the footballs is signed by the OU Heisman Trophy winners. It's up there. There's a ba- uh, another football signed by Bob Stoops. It's up there. There's also a basketball that is signed by the women's basketball team, OU women's basketball team, that made it to the Final Four. Now, they're on the very top. But not only on the very top, they're also encased in some plastic cage. And what that means is you can walk in here and you can look at them. Don't touch them. Don't get that basketball off and go, oh, this is cool. Or football, hey, pastor, go long. No. those, Those are pretty important. And anything that's important in there, you, you, we, I've put up that says, you can look, but do not touch. My friends, that's what treasured love is. In other words, what I want to share with you today is Jesus has you up high, and he has sealed you up by the Holy Spirit of God, and he has said to Satan, you can look at them, but you can't touch them. You cannot rip them from my hands. Nothing you do is going to be able to take them from me. My friends, listen to me. You and I are treasured by God. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit, wrapped up until the day of redemption, until one day we're going to be in heaven with Him. We are not just cheap stuff to Him. The love that we have through Jesus, when we look at each other, we ought to treasure each other. Amen? We're all children of God if we have Jesus in our heart. That pure love starts right here. So he says, let your love that you have for each other in the church be pure. Let the love you have even for the world be pure. Grace love. Love that is gives what is needed rather than what's deserved. Love that shows value. Love that esteems. Love that treasures. And the second part is that it's not fake love. He says, Let it be without hypocrisy. Don't let it be fake love. Don't let it be something you pretend to do. And I began to think about this as I was putting this together. And I I, I went ahead and I looked up what is the definition of hypocrisy. Now, we all know what a hypocrite is. We all, we hate that word, especially in the church, because the only time we ever really hear the word hypocrite is when it's referred to Christians. But you know, the world is full of hypocrites. Amen? Amen. Either religious hypocrites or worldly hypocrites, it doesn't matter. But what is hypocrisy? Well, listen to what hypocrisy is. It's the practice of claiming to have a moral standards or beliefs to which one's own behavior does not conform to. In other words, you, you profess something with your mouth, but the actions do not match it. Now, this is where we need to understand. He says, do not let your love be without, uh, let your love be without hypocrisy. Do not say you love, but don't have anything to back it up. But if you're going to say you love, then show it and let it be what's really going on inside the heart. Now, there's also another type of hypocrisy that I want to get to. Another definition that is, I I, I want to claim it. (laughs) I want to claim it for the church. 
I want to claim it for the church members. And the idea of that, that hypocrisy is this. It's the practice of engaging in the same behavior or activity for which one criticizes someone else. Now this is what I'm talking about in the church. That sometimes we begin to look at each other and we say, I can't believe they're doing that. And I would never be like that. And they need to be better. I'm going to do something different because I don't want to be with them because this is how they are, blah, blah, blah. But it's basically that you look at someone else and you just realize you're doing the same thing that you're accusing them of. Folks, that's hypocrisy. It's not just saying one thing and doing another. It's also holding up someone else to a, to a standard you're not willing to live up to yourself. Listen, I know the church isn't perfect. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. But the fact is that no one should expect someone else to be perfect when we realize we're not. Jesus kind of put it this way. Do not be critical of someone else's little moat they have in their eye when you have this huge beam in yours. Because you can't really see what's going on there because of what you've got in here. Sometimes we get so critical of each other and what we're realizing we're doing, if we would pause for a moment and let our love be without hypocrisy, we would find out we're far more guilty of something than the people we're looking at. Jesus said, let your love be without hypocrisy. Jesus and the religious leaders of the time, man, that's where he struggled with them. Listen to me, we as Christians should be sincere and genuine in showing people Christ in order to bring them to Christ. We can't be expecting something from someone else that we're not willing to do ourselves, but we must also not be saying one thing in here and saying words that our actions aren't backing up. How in the world are we going to lead someone to Jesus when they see us and hear us not even not even glorifying Jesus in the way we act. That's why he says, church, church, let your love be without hypocrisy. And if it is, then read the rest of chapter 12 and all of chapter 13, and you're going to understand how that's possible. But it's not possible if we don't have this love. So there's two characteristics of this love that I want to look at. There's two characteristics. The first one is it's proven by action. Pure love is proven by action. It's not something that we say. Listen, have you ever heard the old term, talk is cheap? Folks, we can say a lot. Do you know how much it's, it costs to say something? Nothing. That's why we have a lot of talkers in the world. Amen? Amen? Rather than a lot of listeners. Because talk is easy. It's backing it up that gets to be a little difficult. But this idea of God love, this idea of pure love, this idea of love without hypocrisy, that's proven by the actions that we have. In Romans 5.8, Romans 5.8 it says, but God demonstrates, you know what demonstrate means? He shows or he proves. God has proven to you and he's proven to me. He's proven to the world his own love toward us. That we, listen, my friends, we don't ever have to question God's love because he's proven it to us. And you say, well, look at all the stuff going on in my life. How does that prove God loves me? It proves that God loves you because it says right here that in while you were yet still sinners, I was still a sinner, Christ died for us. When I needed him, but I didn't deserve him, he said, I love you. And then he said, not only do I, will I tell you I love you, but I'm going to show you that I love you because my son is going to come and he's going to die on the cross for you, even though you are sinful, even though you don't have a desire for him, even though you're going to probably reject him over and over and over, I'm still going to prove my love to you by sending him to you. Listen, my friend, God's talk is not cheap. Because he backed it up. For God so loved the world. How? 
he gave. He showed his love to us. He proved his love. The Bible even asks the question. It says, what greater love could a man show than what? Lay down his life for a friend. What, what more could we possibly do? So I ask the question, what more could God do? What more could he do? He, he, he gave the ultimate. He, he gave Jesus. He, he let Jesus get, die on the cross for us. It's our outward expressions. And when we look at the rest of chapter 12, all of 13, everything is an outward thing. Nothing is backed here. Nothing is held here. Nothing is, 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 is confiscated into us. It's all outward. It's proving constantly what we say and what we mean. It's, it's proving. Can I tell you today, my friends, we, every moment of our lives, we're proving how we feel about something. We may not like that thought, but we prove. We prove it by our actions. But not only is it proven by our actions, but it's, it's measured by sacrifice. It's measured by sacrifice. In other words, not only what I say, and not only that, that I, I, I do something... But I, I, I do it by sacrifice. My friends, do you understand there's a difference of giving and giving and sac giving of sacrifice? There's a difference of giving and sacrificing. We can all give a little something. But this sacrifice is where we really prove our love. I remember, I rem I'm reminded of the story of, of Jesus when he is standing at the treasury. And the Bible says that people were coming and they were giving offerings. And Jesus was just standing over here. And I can imagine that he's standing there. Maybe he leaned up against the wall and have his hands here and his eyes closed. And he's just listening. Listening to all the money that's been dropped in the treasury. And what, what he realized was going on is he wasn't really listening to the money being dropped. He was listening to the heart that was dropping it. Because what they were doing is it's kind of like this. Instead of giving a dollar, they would take a dollar, convert it over to a hundred pennies and take their bag and pour it up and shake it out. And uh, listen to me, a hundred pennies make a whole lot more noise than a dollar. Amen. But can I tell you something? They equal the same amount. So they were making a lot of noise and Jesus was just standing there hearing their heart. And then all of a sudden... He heard a different noise. The Bible says that he heard two little coins drop into the treasury. It made such an impact, it made such a noise that Jesus looked up and he saw her. It made such a noise that Jesus even commented about her. And what he said was, this lady has given everything she has. The others gave out of their surplus. She gave everything. The value to the world would have been very minimal compared with her compared to what everybody else was giving. But can I tell you what they were giving was something they had already calculated. They had already said a couple of things in their life. First of all, Everything is settled. We have enough. We got all the bills paid. We got all the other stuff that we, we saved. We put this. We've done this. We've done this. Okay, I have a little bit left over. Okay, I can possibly give some of that. But I want to give it, but I want to give it where it makes some noise. So I'm going to convert it over and I'm going to show off with it. Everything else had already been taken care of. The calculations were complete. They weren't going to have it. They really didn't need this money anyway, so they gave it. Okay, can I tell you, they gave. Amen? They gave. But this woman, according to Jesus himself, had calculated that this was all I have. This is all I have to live on. I have nothing else to do after this is gone. But I'm going to trust God enough. I'm going to sacrifice and give two pennies. 
that pale in comparison to everybody else, but I'm giving it. I'm sacrificing because I love God enough to sacrifice. Remember what I talked about last week? Says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, as a result of the mercies of God, in other words, for what He's done for you, that you then in turn should be willing to give your bodies a living sacrifice. She's saying, God, because I, I trust you and I know what you've done for me, I'm going to give this. Now, folks, listen, please, new at home, listen. This part of my message had nothing to do with tithing. Amen? It has nothing to do with that has nothing to do with how much you put in the offering plate. What it has to do is the love that we're willing to give others as well. Are we going to be measured by giving of our, of our surplus? Or are we going to be giving by sacrifice? The Bible tells us a very familiar passage of Scripture that everybody knows. It's John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Now, what I want you to notice is that I have it out there on the screen for you. He gave His only begotten. Now, that is, in, is highlighted and underlined because this is, this is the idea of what we're actually talking about. Because here I want you to understand, another word is, that's very important is the word only. He gave His only begotten Son. What that only is, it's important here because in other words, it says He gave Himself. That's all he had to give. He had nothing more to give us. And he gave himself. He gave all. And he, gave, he says, there, there is no other that I could give you. Can I tell you this, my friends? And listen to me at home. Jesus is the only, only, only Son of God. He is the only, only sacrifice. And even he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father. I am the only way that you can get to the Father. It's through me, through Jesus, not through Muhammad, not through Buddha, not through any of these other religions, not through the idea of baptism, not through the idea of giving all your money, not through any other idea other than his only begotten son. That's it. His only begotten. For God so loved the world. Man, it was measured by his sacrifice. Nothing more could he give. There is no other that he could say, well, I'll give you this one, but I'm holding on to this son. That's all I got. It's measured by sacrifice. Jesus was our sacrifice. Amen? He was our sacrifice. None of chapters 12 or 13 can be done unless pure love or God love is at the center of our souls, my friends. Because you and I, we are not anywhere near capable of this love without hypocrisy. Other than we've committed ourselves as a living sacrifice to Him. Turned ourselves over to Him. Now His love works through us. I want to close with this. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, What you do speaks so loud that I can't hear what you say. We can say we love, we love, we love. As a matter of fact, you remember, and this is a test. I know you love tests whenever I preach. But you remember, and, and don't look at your bulletin, but you remember what our vision statement is, right? What's the first part of our vision statement? Say it louder. Say it like you mean it. Love God. What's the second part? Oh, say it like you mean it. All right, now we'll stop there for a second. Love God, love people. Now my question to you is, how much did that cost you? It's just a cute little phrase. Love God, love people. And the third part, of course, is what? Oh, say it like you mean it. There you go. My friends, if we're really going to prove that we love God and we're proving we're going to love people, it better be a pure love. Love without hypocrisy as a result of Committing ourselves a living sacrifice to Him. Holy and acceptable. As a result of what He's done for us. So if you're here today, and I'm wrapping up here. If you're here today, or you're watching on television, you're watching wherever you are on this live stream service. What you do 
after saying what we just said, speaks louder than what you just said. You could, and I had to say it loudly, amen, like you meant it. But can I tell you something as you get ready to leave out of here today? What you do is going to speak louder than what you just said. Right? So let's go, oh, can I, can I ask you this? Let's go out and let's speak the name of Jesus with our lives so boldly that people can't help but hear his name. So it begins by you saying, and you at home, begins by saying, God, here I am. I yield myself to you. And if you're here today and you have not received Jesus into your heart, then I'm here to tell you, you, you are not capable of any of this that we talked about. You need Jesus in your heart. But you can have him today. Today is the day. This is the good news. Is that we, are, we have the potential of this. And again, his name is Jesus. But if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, would you call on his name today? And you say, well, Pastor, I don't know how. Then I want, to, I want to visit with you. I want you to call our church offices, folks. Someone will be there to listen to you, to pray with you, to help you. Because the greatest thing I want to know is that everybody here or everybody watching, that you know Jesus as your Savior. The second thing is that if you know Christ as your Savior, that we can now commit ourselves a living sacrifice to Him. We can recommit our sacrifice to Him. And then we can begin to exhibit that pure love from our hearts because it is coming into us again. It is flowing through us now from Him to us to others. That we can speak the name of Jesus with boldness. Would you do that today? During this next song that we're going to sing as we enter back into a time of praise and worship, can you do that? If you need some help, I'll be here. Call the church office. But let your love be without hypocrisy. Let it start by connecting to Him. I'd like the praise team to come forward as I get ready to pray. And then we're going to stand and we're going to sing. And today, my friend, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of renewal. Would you, would you pray with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, we, we come to you today and we thank you, Lord, for your blessing. We thank you for speaking to us the way that you, you do. Thank you for allowing us to be in this worship service today. And God, I pray right now, if there's someone here, someone watching, that Lord needs you in their life, that Father, you would call upon their name and let, Father, they would, they would cry out to be forgiven, to receive you into their life, to receive that great sacrifice, Lord, that only you could provide us. But Father, I also pray if there's someone here today and they, Lord, for, for whatever reason, man, we may have turned our lives back over to ourselves and Lord, we've begun to live in the world and as the world. But Father, today we want to, want to yield back. We want our love to begin to be pure again because we realize what you've done for us, Lord. Commit each one of us to that. Let us commit ourselves to you in that. Let this church commit ourselves to that. Oh, Father, begin right here, right now, in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to ask you to stand. And would you join us as we enter time of praise and worship?